So if you have an enterprise server in your network at work, um, you should scan neighbor IP addresses, see if there's a SQL server running somewhere, connect without a password, and you know, own the entire thing. Um, if you find the authentication key in a database, which you will, um, because it has to be there, um, then here's an algorithm um, to translate it into something useful that you can then use in the protocols that we um, put the explanation on um, to connect to RIM and build your own cheesy Pulse script to send spam to your boss. Um, the good thing about updates in every piece of software is that when they fix something, um, you can bin div it. Um, so every update gives you a lot of information what they changed and what they fixed. Um, the good thing with RIM is that, um, first of all, you get service packs and hot fixes, like with Microsoft. Um, the release notes are extremely funny. Like, um, it's just very entertaining reading. Um, there are things in there like, I send an invite to two people and someone else's birthday was deleted from the database. And it's like, eh? Okay. <laughs> but good. And what's also very, very interesting, um, RIM actually ships the debug information, the debug symbols, the PDB files with the updates. So if you have a vanilla enterprise server installation, you don't have PDB files, you don't have symbols, you don't have names for your functions. If you get an update, um, whatever file is touched will have the new PDB file with it. Um, so suddenly, with, when you update your enterprise server, you get like all the names resolved, all the classes resolved, everything else, Ida is gonna be really, really happy. So talking about the code, um, the code style, it is C++ by the book pattern implementation, fairly large classes, STL heavily used, pretty hard to reverse engineer, and it turns out it's surprisingly good code. STL helps a lot because if you have like string classes, you don't go string copy everything back and forth. Um, and the coding style seems to be, if in doubt, let's check. So the receiving function, for example, goes ahead and says, okay, I do select on the socket and see if there is a byte to receive. Then I call a function. If there is a byte to receive, I call a function, which is gonna do a select on a socket and see if there is a byte to receive. Then it calls a function, which is doing a select on a socket to see if there is a byte to receive, which then calls a function, which actually receives a byte. Um, so uh, this is a coding style that is inherited on the entire system, and it is defensive, co defensive coding. It is good. Um, and one thing that I noticed was generally they are using signed integers. So if you're hunting bugs in enterprise server, um, go for signedness bugs. Interesting libraries. You want to see what libraries they use. Um, we went for obviously parsing. We went for what um, stuff that's actually exposed to emails sent in and that operates on foreign data. So we went for the parsing, especially for the attachment parsing. Um, for parsing office documents, they just use the iStream classes. So um, if you have a vulnerability in parsing um, based on, on Office, then that might work. Um, for HTML, they use MS HTML4. Um, there is MS XML SDK installed. Um, apparently, according to Ian, it's for the Sync server, but nobody knows why the entire SDK is really installed. So you, you get a SDK documentation on a desktop. Um, and there's a parsing product from a company called Horizon that they bought quite a while ago um, that runs a central parsing engine um, and pretty much works um, like the Internet Explorer. So it takes the file extension and then um, looks at the first five or six bytes of the file and tries to figure out if it's the same thing. And then it kicks off some sub-parser. So, in other words, if you're um, sending something and that's a PDF and you call it .doc and you manage to build a PDF that in the first five or three bytes looks like a doc file, which in this case is not possible but in other combinations might, then you can smuggle a file in that's just a different type. And the sub parser then again tries to figure out what it is on a different site. Um, and so you could get around some um, some protections and trigger some parsing bugs that you otherwise can't. Um, then there's Zlib for decompression. Um, the zip handling code, very interesting, is it looked from the coding style, it looked totally different than the entire other code. Um, 
So I'm like, okay, why, why is this flat C code and everything else is C++? Turns out it's a copy and paste from the contrib directory of Zlib. Um, they just like took the entire unzip.z and compiled it in. Um, and of course, the Zlib version wasn't really current. Um, I think now they're running current? Current, okay. And for image parsing, there has been graphics magic. Graphics magic is a spin-off from image magic. Now, image magic is not really known for very secure and good designed code. Graphics magic turns out to be even worse. Um, and the thing is, it was fully compiled with all debug code, with everything you can imagine, linked into the server. So um, I checked the website of Graphics Magic, and this is the file formats Graphics Magic supports. Now, this is quite a resource to find parsing bugs. Um, so then checking the change log um, tells you things like applied security patch from Christie. Looking at the security patch, turns out it yeah, stops doing mem copies all over the place with like values from the file. Um, <coughs> And they, they constantly fix stack overflows while image parsing, which they don't even consider a security issue. So um, it even supports its own format string mechanism that it automatically applies to all image comments that you have or Im image fields. Like most image formats support um, a copyright string where you can put in who, who made the image. Um, if you put in like a 100% T um, somewhere in an image and send it to a BlackBerry user, the temporary file that's generated by the enterprise server for conversion will have a comment field that um, contains the file name um, of the temporary file because that's what the library supports and nobody actually cared about that when they compiled it into the enterprise server. Um, and then, of course, you find bugs. Because, well, if you have an open source library with all the debug information and all the version information, um, your binary auditing becomes a source code auditing and you can easily grab for bugs and happily find integer overflows. In this case, heap overflow in a TIFF parser. So what, what programming should you never do? You should never take width of the image, height of the image, multiply them and, and multiply that by 32 to figure out how much bytes you need as storage. Because if some asshole, like, this one here, um, puts in like all F as width and like 10 as a height, the multiplication will overflow and you will allocate very little memory and put a lot of stuff in there. Um, so that happened for the TIFF parser, that happened for the PNG parser. Um, interesting enough, the P lib PNG people try to prevent people from being really stupid um, by putting a um, define in the code that defines a max width and a max height um, of a million. So um, that if you multiply d both, um, you don't get over integers. Um, the thing is that the image magic coder managed to multiply that by several other factors and still got an overflow. Um, of course, the Zlib um, was pretty much um, not current, so there has been vulnerabilities in there. Interesting enough, the libpng that they linked with was absolutely current, so that again is very useful knowledge because you now know that different people are using um, different change management procedures when maintaining their code. One lib is current, one is not. Obviously, there is no process. <coughs> now, having vulnerability in the email attachment parser gives you the ability to, okay, so that's like, for everyone who doesn't know, that's the internationally accepted ASCII um, version of an asshole. Um, so there are assholes on the internet. We all know that. So here is one. And it is sending an email to someone who has a Blackberry um, with an image attachment. Um, this image attachment um, turns out to explode right in the face of the attachment service. Um, and you get code execution here. Now, it would be pretty silly to go ahead and have a shell code try to connect back out to you because if the firewall administrator is halfway worth his money, he's not gonna allow this connection. So what you actually do is you own, of course, the entire system, and then you use the existing code in your enterprise server, call the existing functions and say to the SQL database, okay, retrieve 
please the SRP authentication key. And then you use other existing calls, other existing functions whose names were happily provided by the PDB files and tell it please send an email to me asshole at hotmail containing the SRP key. So that is actually doable. Um, which means you have to separate the attachment service because if you see it from a, from a threat modeling point of view, attachment service is almost 100% attack surface. The only thing it does is parsing stuff that potential assholes are sending in. So the likelihood of something going wrong is pretty high. So what you have to do and what's actually supported is um, separate the attachment service on its own machine and put a firewall in between. Um, so it's only talking to this box and not you know, to the internet. Um, as of today, there is actually a white paper they just finished um, on the RIM website. It's probably really hard to find, but um, I guess it is there um, that details how you do that. So if, if you're one of those poor people that have to um, care about the security of an enterprise server, it's highly recommended reading. Um, interesting enough, if you put an attachment service outside, then it needs a communication protocol to talk to the main server which is unauthenticated XML over port 1999. Um, and you can query stuff um, from the attachment service, but you can also um, set the number of processes and someone forgot to put limits in there. Um, so you can set the number of processes to zero, which of course makes it a very happy unemployed attachment service. Um, or you can try out how many processes are supported on Windows in current concurrent running, so I, I got it up to 9,000 and then my machine froze. But you can set it to arbitrary ways. So, um, step seven, um, you do vendor communication. And that's really interesting and really important. Um, Ian and I talked about a lot um, about this, this entire thing because you need to tell people and you need to tell the company that you attacked what you did unless you have criminal motivations. Um, because both sides greatly profit from research people are doing, even if they're not paid for it. Um, the well plan, if, if your analysis is a well planned thing, if you went ahead and like, followed more or less um, the steps I outlined in the beginning, um, then you can very clearly arg um, give an argument why you did that and what they have to focus on. Um, in the future to prevent this type of attack. I mean, we didn't attack BlackBerry because, um, just because we hated them. Um, we attacked BlackBerry <laughs> um, because people really asked us for what do you think about the security of this stuff and, and where are the problems. Now the problems are known. So now RIM is in a position to have an outside opinion on how do people actually attack our stuff? Where do we have to concentrate our efforts on? Um, what they did. So they went ahead and reworked the entire attachment image parsing story, got rid of this hilarious piece of open source software called Image Magic. Um, RIM customers are actually like moving their stuff into the right position, separating the attachment servers, um, checking the database, because, well, in a default installation, you're happy if it works. Now they actually go ahead and see, oh, the database doesn't have an account um, or a password on the SA account. We need to set an account here. So people are securing this stuff. And then, of course, you can go ahead, print offensive t-shirts. Um, I got you one, by the way. Um, and <laughs> meet with everyone involved and get drunk and like, send greetings to everyone and stuff. Questions? <laughs> 